DBQ. Hey. DBQ. Welcome back. This is the part three of a video series on the DBQ. In the last videos, we described how to read the prompt and analyze the prompt, how to break down the documents and annotate the documents, how to group those documents in order to form uh, claims that form the basis of your thesis, and then how to write both the contextualization and the thesis in your introductory paragraph. This video will focus on writing the body paragraphs. So once you have that thesis written that ultimately connects those various claims that you've identified by grouping the documents, what you're going to want to do is focus on each of those individual body paragraphs. So you want to start each body paragraph with a topic sentence which identifies one of the claims that you asserted in your thesis. So for example, one of the topic sentences could look like this. The spread of Buddhism transformed Chinese beliefs because it, and again we have to complete that claim A. What exactly were the transformations that are suggested by the, the that group of documents that we've identified? So that's a topic sentence which should be in each of your major body paragraphs. You can state what you have in your thesis as long as what you have in your thesis is really solid and clear. If it's not, this ultimately gives you a chance to restate what it is that you're trying to assert and then once you get down to your conclusion you want to rewrite your thesis in a way that's more consistent with what you're you're arguing in your topic sentences now for each of the body paragraphs you also are going to then use the various documents that support that particular claim that you're making so that's again our peanut butter and our metaphor so you may have two or three or even four documents or even one document that you're using per body paragraph. So you're going to use the content of at least three documents to address the topic of the prompt and that ultimately will be worth one point. Now if you're able to successfully use six of the documents and accurately use the content of at least six documents, that's worth two points. And so obviously you're going to need multiple body paragraphs where you're asserting claims and then using source material from the documents in order to support those claims. So what does it look like to use a document? Well, first of all, you're just going to paraphrase or use short quotes. You don't want to use long quotes. That's not what this is about. So very short, you know, two, three, four word snippets of the document with the rest of the document ultimately paraphrased. Really, we're just talking about two sentences for each document max. I mean, three is really kind of pushing it. I, I see, though, too often students have this idea in mind that they need to go into some kind of great depth about each document. That's not the case with the DBQ. Ultimately, you will run out of time if you spend too much time on each individual document. So you're going to add a citation or a parenthesis after the first sentence of each document. So, for example, when you get to the end of your first sentence, you're going to put parentheses doc five or whatever document you're using and then you're going to um, continue to write your next sentence so let's do a quick example of what this might look like let's let's take a document this is from a different dbq not the buddhism in china dbq but instead one about technology in the roman empire and in han china so i want you to take a minute uh, to pause the video and to read through this document Okay, so let's imagine that we created a claim as part of our thesis that both the Han and the Romans had a positive attitude towards large public projects. And what we needed to do was use this document as support for our subclaim here that we've identified. So what we would do is, again, one to two sentences, we would state, for example, again, that's always good whenever you're using evidence to start your transition into evidence with for example. For example, a Roman general named Frontius displayed a positive attitude towards aqueducts, describing their effectiveness at providing water for multiple public uses. And then our citation, parentheses, doc five. He described the aqueducts as more impressive than the Egyptian pyramids or Greek architecture. And again, the second sentence helps tie us back and support our claim here, which is that Romans had a positive attitude toward large public projects. What kind of source? So whenever you're using documents, for three of those documents, you also need to source the documents. And when you source a document, you're explaining the significance of the author. In the, the test they refer to this as the point of view, the purpose of the document, 
with the intended audience or the time period or historical context. And this is going to be worth one point if you can correctly source three. Now, I always encourage students to source four because this is a hard skill and oftentimes students make a mistake on this section. And so if you source three and make a mistake, then you only get two correct, you get zero points. If you source four and make a mistake on one, then you potentially could still score the point. So it's good to put some insurance in for this particular skill. Now, when we source documents, we have an acronym we use in class, which is we take the documents apart by focusing on who the author is, um, what are the characteristics in terms of you know, what job they have, what is their gender, what is their social class, what is their age, what is their ideology, what is their religion. Any of those factors ultimately may have a bearing upon why the particular author is saying what he or she is saying. We also might consider the purpose of the document. That's the why is the document being created? Is it created for propaganda? Is it a speech, a big public speech? Is it a diary? All of those purposes may suggest why the particular author is saying what they're saying. Next, the intended audience. That's the to whom. So is it to a friend? Is it to a family member? Is it to a person of higher class, like a king? Is it to a lower class person? All of those things could have bearing also on the content of the document. And then finally, the time period or the historical context, that's the when. You're identifying what is going on at the time and ultimately how might that bear upon what is being written in the document. Now, all of these factors can have bearing upon the ultimate reliability of the document. So how credible is the document? Is there evidence of bias? And if so, why? That's the critical piece these students oftentimes miss is why is the source potentially biased as a result of these characteristics? Now, when you take documents apart, all you have to do is focus on one of these, either the author, the purpose, the audience, the time period. You don't have to do all of them. You don't have to do two of them. You only have to choose one of these characteristics, like say the author, and then identify why that this particular characteristic of the author has bearing upon what is being said in the document. Now, do not merely repeat information from the source line. It must move beyond a mere description of the author and explain why he or she says what he or she says. And don't simply say, well, the author is biased. Every document and historical source has some bias to it. Or don't just say the document is somehow reliable or unreliable. You have to explain why the author is biased. You can also quote if there's, again, a pretty nice short little snippet, which might explain or highlight some of those biases. But again, don't go into length and, and use long quotes in this section of the body paragraphs as well. So again, let's practice using this document. So look at the source line, Frontius, a Roman general governor of Britain and water commissioner for the city of Rome, the first century CE. If we're thinking about those characteristics in terms of how it ultimately impacts what he's saying, why he's saying it, your source might look like this. So we have again our topic sentence and then our section here using the document. And then the source for this might look something like this. So because the author was also the water commissioner for Rome, he may have been influenced to say positive things about aqueducts, something under his control in that position. So again, it's suggesting a limitation of this particular source and a potential bias of this particular source, given his function as the water commissioner speaking about issues relating to water in Rome. All right, so the next step is to add some outside evidence, some supportive outside relevant evidence beyond the evidence that is found in the documents. And this is worth one point. And again, you can seamlessly weave this into your body paragraphs. It doesn't necessarily matter where you do this, but you must do this correctly one time to score the point, just one time. So you have to identify some outside evidence that's relevant, that's missing ultimately from the documents, but that's something that, that you feel like could help bolster or support your argument. So the evidence must be specifically described. It can't just be a simple phrase or reference. You won't just get a point for mentioning a word or two. Ultimately, it has to be a specific description of outside evidence. So you can think of it kind of as that missing puzzle piece, right? Something that you're like, well, they probably could have given me a document about this and they didn't, but if they, I would have gotten this document, I know about this, I can add this to my argument. So outside evidence functions as support for a particular point made in an argument, which is analogous to the function of evidence drawn from the documents, meaning this basically serves as additional support in the same way that documentary source evidence um, provides support as well.
So an example, let's say this is your topic sentence. The Han had a much more positive view about tools used by the lower classes than the Romans. So I could add some additional evidence that I knew from outside, something I learned in class might be something like this. This difference in attitude may be explained based on the Upon the structural differences in the two societies, slaves made up nearly 33% of Roman societies. By contrast, only about 1% of Han Chinese society were slaves. That's not information from the documents, but if it, there was a document, again, this would function as support for the claim that I was making here, which is that the Han had a much more positive view about tools used by lower classes than the Romans. So the next step is to write a conclusion. And in your conclusion, you should strengthen your argument by showing it is not limited to the situation framed by the prompt. You can score one point potentially for complex understanding if you do this. Maybe there's some kind of a connection. So, I... so we describe this as establishing a connection in our class. So connection to your argument. So connect your argument to a similar argument involving a different region within the same time period. So here they give us a time period from 300 CE to 900 CE. So if, if, it's, if it's region specific, and again, sometimes these DBQs aren't region specific, and so you can't necessarily choose this option if there's no real specific region that's tied to the, to the prompt. But in this particular case, the one that the practice problem we've been doing, talking about the spread of Buddhism to China, that's region specific, right? It's dealing with East Asia. And so if you can think of another example, let's say maybe even of like another religion that spread to another part of the world and the changes that it led to were very similar to the kind of changes that we see in China, that could be a connection that works. You could also connect the argument to a similar argument in another time period. So you can say, well, this reminds me of another time outside of this period where a very similar process, historical process, took place. And so that's the connection. And I encourage you to start your conclusion with it if you can. If you're running out of time, this is something that you can leave out if you need to. The one way to do this, and I always encourage students to, to try, is to start with in the same way that and then restate your argument or a part of your argument and then make that connection to say this is similar to and then state the connection that you're trying to make or the similarity that you're trying to draw. So in the same way that and then restate part of your argument and then make that connection. And then finally, in your conclusion, you can take another crack at writing your thesis. If, for example, as you're writing those body paragraphs, you've made some kind of substantive changes, either as a result of becoming more specific or more clear, you ultimately have a chance at rewriting your thesis in your concluding paragraph. Don't simply, though, just rewrite what you wrote in the introductory paragraph. You either got the point or you didn't get the point in the introductory paragraph. Simply rewriting it word for word or nearly word for word is not going to get you the point. So if you're going to take a shot at another thesis, one of the things that I suggest that you do is to specify that conclusion that you're going to write. And you do this by writing in conclusion and then you restate your thesis. All right, so that concludes our review of the document-based question. I encourage you to continue to use the outline that I've given you uh, as a way to practice of the document-based question before you write it in class. And there may be some later videos also on particular skills like the contextualization, outside evidence, and sourcing. And so you may want to check back to see if those videos are eventually posted as well. Thanks for watching. Suggested by the, the, that group of documents that we've identified. So that's a topic sentence, which should be in each of your major body paragraphs. You can state what you have in your thesis as long as what you have in your thesis is really solid and clear. If it's not, this ultimately gives you a chance to restate what it is that you're trying to assert. And then once you get to what you're going to want to do is focus on each of those individual body paragraphs. So you want to start each body paragraph with a topic sentence, which identifies one of the claims that you asserted in your thesis. So for example, one of the topic sentences could look like this. The spread of Buddhism transformed Chinese beliefs because it, and again, we have to complete that claim A. What exactly were the transformations that are suggested? DBQ A A Teach me how DBQ Welcome back. This is the part 3 of a video series on the DBQ. 
In the last videos, we described how to read the prompt and analyze the prompt, how to break down the documents and annotate the documents, how to group those documents in order to form uh, claims that form the basis of your thesis, and then how to write both the contextualization and the thesis in your introductory paragraph. This video will focus on writing the body paragraphs. So once you have that thesis written that ultimately connects those various claims that you've identified by grouping the documents down to your conclusion, you want to rewrite your thesis in a way that's more consistent with what you're, you're arguing in your topic sentences. Now for each of the body paragraphs, you also are going to then use the various documents that support that particular claim that you're making. So that's again our peanut butter and our metaphor. So you may have two or three or even four documents or even